I'm going to be talking to you first and foremost about digital marketing in 2023 and beyond, and basically organic strategies as we're going through that. As Sam gave us a little bit of an intro a few minutes ago in terms of who we are, so my name's Chris, I've been running ads on Meta, so Facebook, Instagram for the better part of 15 years. As soon as I talk, start talking, my phone starts ringing, that's always a good start, isn't it? I'm going to be going through those sort of specific strategies that we've seen, we've tried. So as a company, we manage around about 2 million a year in paid ad spend. Uh, we are attached to around about 160 different business accounts, and we actively manage about 40 to 50 strategies across both organics and about across paid ads. There will be bits today where we're going to talk about a variety of different platforms. You will see when we're talking about paid ads, we have half of it will be talking about Google, half of it will be talking about Meta. The reason we talk about Meta first and foremost is that will cover your Facebook, Instagram. TikTok literally ripped off the back end of Facebook and Instagram, so it is exactly the same. So if you know Facebook, Instagram, you will know TikTok. And then we'll talk about a few other sort of platforms as well. But the main bulk of your potential target audience is going to be on those. So the five things that I'm going to be talking about today are where your customer's attention is, how easy everything is for people now, whether you are invisible online or not, personable over everything, press the back button. See, this is why I had the mouse. It was very well organized until the mouse stopped working. Uh, personable over personalized, and we're gonna talk about how Google are removing cookies at the end, and if you are using that in retargeting adverts, you should be scared, because I know we are. So, first and foremost, we're gonna talk about where your customer's attention is. So, you see, he's getting it now. It's very good. What we, the reason I talk about customers' attention is very, very often when we're talking about what you need to post on social media, businesses look at it from a perspective of, right, this is my business, this is the information I need to get out. And very often that's the wrong approach. It should be done in such a way of, right, what are my potential customers paying attention to and where do I need to be? I have 10 wonderful statistics on the next slide which I'm going to run through. These are live stats, I checked all of them last night, they are the most up-to-date stats from surveys that we have. These are the top tips for Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, but the majority of the rest of the platforms will have similar sort of things. First one is that in the UK there are currently 53 million active social media users, which is nearly, well, well over three quarters of the entire population of the United Kingdom. If you aren't on social media, and your business isn't on social media in some way, shape or form, you are invisible to an awful lot of those people. Second stat that is probably a little bit frightening is 98% of those users that use social media use it on a mobile device. Now we will be talking during this in terms of your sales process and how easy things are. If you're running things that aren't mobile optimized, you really need to be looking at that sooner rather than later. And I'll talk about that in a second kind of bit. Third point is the average UK user spends 190 minutes on social media a day, which is both depressing and also quite frightening. But it is a stat. There is the screen time stat is probably more worrying just under that. Average UK screen time, so that's the time that somebody in the UK will stare at a screen, is five hours a day. What's more worrying about that is that over 50% of them said that they stare at screens for 11 plus hours, and 25% of that said it was 14 plus hours. If you take into account the fact that people could potentially get eight hours of sleep, that means all but two or three hours of a day. 25% of the UK's population is staring at the screen. You do have to eat sometime, but most people are ordering it on a screen and it's being delivered while they do that. So the point with those two stats in particular are that people's attention is on these devices. They are staring at those devices. And where Sam will talk about things like Google adverts a little bit later on, which is somebody that has made the decision that they want to search something, they want more information, they want to buy something, when we're talking about a lot of strategy, especially organic strategy, you are interrupting what they're doing on their daily. You might be interrupting their newsfeed to see in between pictures from their friends, posts from groups they like, posts from pages and celebrities that they follow. Your posts are going in the middle of those, so you're automatically competing with that. If you're doing, if you're doing that by screaming, please buy my product, people will ignore that and they won't jump onto it. Last stat on that page has disappeared, Sam, thank you. I haven't read that one out yet. Smoothly, it's going smoothly today. Uh, the last stat on the page previous to that, when Sam goes back a page, there we go. I'm going to make sure this mouse works so that I don't need to shout at you during the day. 
So the last stat is that 80% of UK internet users were actively engaged in social media at least once per month in 2020. Now what I mean by actively engaged is they have done something on social media. Not just logged in and had a look, they've actively gone through, clicked on posts, shared, liked, commented. It's about 80% of the UK's internet usage was actively on, engaged on social media. On the next page, the next five stats, which again frightened me when I was going through them. So, over 53 million UK, out of the 53 million UK social media users, 43 of them use Facebook. Anybody that ever turns around to me and says, oh, people don't use Facebook anymore, they use Instagram. They are lying. They are just not telling the truth. Most young people will use alternative platforms, but they tend to also have Facebook profiles as well. The stats are there in terms of active social media users. Facebook is still by far the most used platform. What's also worth bearing in mind is the younger generation tend to be looking towards TikTok and Instagram, which I will be talking about today as well. But, as we all know, younger people tend to spend less money because they have less money. And if you as a business are targeting people that are slightly older than 18, generally speaking, you are going to be wanting to have a look at Facebook as a big part of that. What's good about Facebook and Instagram being the same platform, we'll talk about, or the same back-end platform, we will talk about the difference in organic strategies between the two, but the ad strategies are built exactly the same way. You can just select a button and it will run across all of those again. Sam will talk to you about that in the second talk. There are 32.3 million Instagram users in the UK. You will notice that those two numbers by mathematics have to overlap. So again, this is where people's attention is. Most people when they're on social media might spend the majority of their time on one platform, but very rarely are they only on one platform. A stat that isn't on this page, when it comes to LinkedIn, because we talk to a lot of B2B professional businesses, and everybody says, oh, my audience is only on LinkedIn. Again, that isn't true. A recent survey was 0.82% of people that were on LinkedIn said that they were only ever on LinkedIn, that they didn't use another platform, which means over 99% of people on LinkedIn are on other platforms, and people spend more time on those other platforms. What you have to remember in the mentality of your potential customers <coughs> is that Let's take LinkedIn for example. If you're on LinkedIn, generally you're in a business mindset. You're going there to network, you're going there to advertise, you're going there to find something. You aimlessly scroll through Instagram, Facebook and TikTok. And it's interrupting that aimless scrolling, which is disruptive marketing, which is what you kind of want to do. The last two stats, uh, oh, sorry, the middle stat, 97% of adult internet users in the UK have watched YouTube videos and 42% of those access the platform every day. YouTube is a huge platform and a huge opportunity. Now I'm not necessarily talking about you having a, an amazing presence on YouTube. There will be things that I talk about today, how you can interact with what you're already currently doing and put that up on YouTube, but I understand for a lot of people not wanting to be in front of the camera, I completely understand that. What you can do with that platform, knowing the stats, is know that you can run ads on those platforms and Sam will talk specifically about YouTube a little bit later on and how effective that can be. Last two stats. If you ever worried about your children, the last stat is probably going to scare the life out of you. 87.5% of children aged 12 to 15 have a social media profile in the UK. That is a true statistic. Most of those are lying about their age on social media because you can't have one. Can't have a Facebook page under 13, I believe. Uh, so half of them are lying. Um, but social media is going to be part of the generations that are coming through. And one thing, again, when I talk to people about their target audience, if somebody says to me, my target audience is people aged 25 to 30, and then this demographic and this demographic, well, every five years, the people that are in that audience are completely different to they were five years ago, because that's naturally how it works. And you are coming through those ages having people spending a lot less time in their old traditional means and a lot more time in digital means. We will talk very briefly about the metaverse. I'm not spending a huge amount of time talking about that today. But that is something that we're paying a very, very keen eye on because it's growing at an alarming rate. And the last fact, now Sam and I dispute the last fact, but I put it up because you think it's more than 9.2. Yeah, I mean, the rapid growth of TikTok as a platform, it's, I mean, that stat was taken, what, every It was taken January. That was the last recorded stat I'd seen from it. Yeah. And I wanted to make sure. TikTok as a platform massively accelerated by coronavirus. Everybody was stuck at home, it, it exploded as a platform. But the projections are that by 2026 it will be roughly 
two thirds of its way to the entire Instagram usage in the UK. TikTok is a hugely emerging platform, and how it has emerged, and I'll touch on that as well, how it has emerged has influenced changes that Facebook and Instagram have made. Specifically, their platform is designed to show you content that it assumes you will like, not content necessarily from people that you follow. And it is an incredibly good organic platform. We'll touch on that. We're literally experiencing that at the moment because I posted a video last night which currently has 727,000 views. Uh, my phone's been going nuts. There's probably a phone call from my wife telling, her, telling me to stop doing it. So, the next bit. This is me talking about how easy things are today, right? And I want to talk about your sales process on a digital side and how that can have a huge influence on what you do. The reason I talk about how easy things are at the moment, Sam and I were in my house last night, we needed batteries for this week. I said, Alexa, order me batteries, and batteries will be delivered to my front door tomorrow morning. That's all I had to do. It told me, this is in your basket, would you like to buy it? Yes, brilliant, it will be delivered tomorrow morning. That is how easy it is to buy things online now. Amazon spent millions and millions and millions. If you sell a product, what Amazon do and how to emulate what they do is a really, really good way of being as efficient as you can. They spent millions in putting in a one-click buy now button onto their platform, both on their app and on their website. It uses your stored card details and your stored uh, primary address. You click one-click buy, it will be delivered to you as soon as you as soon as it can be. The other thing to bear in mind is Shopify, which is one of the biggest e-commerce based platforms that's out there. We also spend a lot of money investing in people having a shop pay account, where if I buy from a Shopify account and I go to another website of a completely different business that also has a Shopify account, I have the ability to one click buy by using the stored address and card details. There is a reason these companies have been spending so much to get that process as efficient as possible. We had a client uh, about a year ago now Sold online, sold a good quantity online, had a lot of people coming back and buying from them again and again and again. But they were struggling to get new people, especially younger people, into what they were doing. We went through their buying process, and at the end of their buying process, it was so difficult to find an address that a lot of people were dropping off of that process, and we could see that in the data. They put in an automatic address lookup where you start typing in it and it automatically fills it out. They saw a 23% uplift in cart completion just from having a, a postcode lookup as part of that process. I advise every client that we bring on board and everybody that I speak to in consultations that if you haven't gone through your buying process on a phone in the last six months, do it and compare it to the last time that you bought something online. And if there are steps that take you longer during it, really have a look at optimizing that as much as you can. This is the same for e-commerce, but it's also the same for service-based businesses. So if you look for leads and you need people inquiring with you as a business, if you're asking them 15 questions up front at the point at which they see your first posts or first adverts, you're asking a lot of somebody in that particular instance. So you make that as simple as possible because if you're selling something online as a product, your competition is Amazon. And Amazon's process is as smooth as it possibly can be. They may not be your direct competition, but I guarantee the people that are buying from you online have also bought from Amazon. And they may be subconsciously or even consciously comparing how easy it is for them to do that versus how easy it is for them to go on Amazon and, and buy it that way. Very often we've seen processes where people have deliberately gone out of that process and into another one because of how simple it is. This is a very overweight example of me, but as you can probably tell by my wonderful physique, I'm quite akin to a takeaway every now and then. Back in London when I was over there, you could order Pizza Hut and Domino's through their apps. And when you went through the Pizza Hut app, there is an option for you to pay by Apple Pay. If you do that, they've tried to make it optimised by pulling through your address and phone number from your account. But when they've tried to do that, the phone numbers never get recognised by Pizza Hut. So the only way you can buy it is by going and finding your card unless you know your card number off by heart. I've gone through all of this process to the end of that, ordered the pizza, got, got to the point where I'm about to click pay, can't find my card, so I've gone out of that and then ordered Domino's because I know on that I can Apple Pay and I don't need to worry. It seems like a really ridiculous example, but there will be situations where people are going through your process and ultimately you don't know why they've dropped out. There will be a drop off at every stage from visiting the website, adding to the cart, starting the checkout, going all the way through to buying. There will be drop offs there. If you're limiting the amount of stages and making those stages as smooth as possible as you go through, 
you're actually going to increase your conversion rates. And I say this to everybody, if your website conversion rate is currently at 1% and you can take that to 2%, it doesn't sound like you need to make a huge amount of tweaks and changes to get there, but it will double your online revenue. So it's worth going through and being really critical and not just going through yourselves, going through with people that you know, people that can help you, because your return customers who love your products or are already coming back and back will sacrifice a little bit of functionality because they know that they get the quality at the end of it. But new customers coming through, you have one chance to make that first impression. I know the Theory 11 playing cards that, that we ordered a while back. We saw an advert for playing cards, quite expensive playing cards, but a good collector's item, so we went through the process. The company that sells them direct are an American-based company, so the price online was $11 something, etc. Went through, went all the way to the end, said $44, and then it said plus. $8 in tax plus $10 in shipping. And that annoyed me more than anything because it was an advert that was run to a UK based audience and none of us in here are used to seeing that plus tax unless we're talking about professional services plus VAT. So I deliberately went to one of their competitors who had the price at £10 in English pounds all the way through, got to the end, even with the shipping at the end of it, it worked out cheaper for me. But I deliberately did that because that was such a jarring experience for a UK based audience that it stopped me by. Now one thing I hear an awful lot is that price is the main reason people don't buy my product. That is not correct. And very, very rarely is it correct. People will buy your product because they want to buy your product. And generally, generally speaking, there are three main reasons that people buy. Psychologically, it is because they've always bought your product, everybody else is buying your product, or at least they think everybody else is buying your product, or it feels natural to buy that product. Now, first one, fairly self-explanatory. If they bought from you before, they will go back and they will buy from you. Regardless of how difficult that gets made, they will generally be more likely to buy than anybody else coming through. And if you can encourage them to rebuy and come back and come back and come back and increase the lifetime value of someone, then it's so much easier to do that than trying to acquire new customers every single time. The third talk of the day is on automation and data collection. We will talk about really, really good ways for you to be able to nurture people after they've bought from you. Everyone else is buying it. Now, this is generally down to things that we like to call social proof. So if you go on Amazon, there is a reason why on Amazon's listings, you have the reviews above the price. Because they know that people care more about having a reviewed product than having the price. And most people, generally speaking, there will be exceptions, so we quite often talk in generalizations. But most people, if they see something that's at 2,000 reviews and it's 4.8 stars out of 5, and it's £15, versus what looks like the exact same product that is £9.50 but has two reviews, most people will opt for the more expensive one. That's what we mean by most people don't buy on price. They buy on what they perceive and what they feel. Very often they feel the value as well. If price was all that everybody ever bought on, then there would be one standard price for a car, and that would be it. And it's a good example of how that is the case. The last one is it feels natural to buy it. Now, very often again, when we're talking to people about their sales process and about how they go through, they try and make it, well, this is the way that we work as a company, so that's the way it has to be. But if it isn't natural and it doesn't feel like that going through for people, then it becomes an issue. So when we're talking about social media posts, by show of hands, who in here follows a page purely so that that page can sell you stuff? Three, four, five. Out of a fair amount of you. Who follows social media pages more often than not because they're interested in the content, the value that it's putting out, or it's something that you follow celebrities? Almost all of you. We, as a, we're a marketing company. We offer marketing services. We have clients that come, as, come pay us for a wide range of consultation, for full service. Our content on our social media is mainly influenced by the podcast that we put out and the clips and the value. You'll see Jack moving around today. He does work for us, don't worry. He's, just not, he's not just a weirdo that has a camera. He's going around today and we're recording these talks to put up on our socials. You guys will have access to the full recordings. We'll send them to you when they're edited. But we will take clips from different points that we make during today and that will go up as our social content. We know that people will follow our page because we offer value. And we know the fact that we offer value, they may then come to us direct or they may see an advert and we'll talk about how to show those people adverts later on. They may see an advert and they'll already go, yes, these guys know what they're talking about, they've already subconsciously done it. 
So the next question is, can your customers actually see what you're doing? Now when it comes to organic strategy, can anybody guess at what the average percentage of your followers, your posts get shown to by default without any engagement? Can anybody guess? Just shout that number. Five posts. It's about six percent on average. So five to six percent of your following will naturally see your posts. Now what's also important about that number is it's not just five or six random percent. It's usually five or six the most engaged that follow your page. So the people that like and comment and share more often than not will see your posts more often than not. It also gives business owners a slightly warped view on when they see their own content. Because you guys will interact with your own business's content more than anybody else will. So if you post something, generally speaking, you will see it. Most of the people that follow your page don't. So when I talk about can customers actually see you, if all you're doing is posting content that is, right, buy my stuff, here is an offer, buy this, buy this, buy this, people aren't going to engage in it. They have no real reason to engage in it. You might get a few posts every now and then, and it is slightly different to groups, which I'll touch on in a couple of minutes. But if they're not getting it shown, you need to be able to work on that. Now, ways to do that, you can encourage engagement by putting something up that might be a question to get people to ask. Very often our adverts, the first line of an advert tends to be a question that is relating to the pain point that a product will solve. And I say product and service. Sam very kindly uses this example for me all the time. People don't buy shampoo, they buy clean hair. And thank you for using that when you're talking to me, but... Welcome every time. You'll be there soon. <laughs> um, the reason that we say that is it's true. People don't tend to buy whatever the product is, they tend to buy the problem that that product solves. And everybody sat out there today will either sell something or sell a service that in some way, shape or form will benefit the person that's receiving that. Nobody really gets into business purely to do something that nobody really wants to do, unless you're a pharmaceutical company in America, but that's a separate thing. So what I'm asking is, can your customers see you? There are a few tips and hints here that I can give you. Number one, is Google's network, especially if you have a physical premises, will allow you to create a Google My Business page and have your premises put there. I've lived over in Armagh now for about, coming up to a year, moved uh, just after Christmas last year, and all of my family have been from this area. So I know over here, if you need a product or service, we all ask our friends and family what we would do. I came over here, my car broke down about five months afterwards. Finding a mechanic locally without knowing the area and trying to Google and find that mechanic was one of the hardest things that I've ever had to do. I had to find somebody that I knew could come and pick up the van. Now, I called my cousins and I said, have you got a mechanic that you'd recommend? Immediately, yes, these guys called them. They weren't available for six weeks. So trying to find somebody else was impossible. Do I know there are loads of mechanics around here? Yes, of course there will be. But were they visible on Google when I was doing what I'm used to doing in terms of Googling, looking on social media? No. So I have to ask the question, are you as visible as you need to be? So Google My Business is a great way to be able to do that. You can set up a profile so that when people search for it, you'll get a little blurb and it will appear on Google Maps. In terms of social media, my personal advice, if you've got the resources and the ability to do it, is to be ever-present across most platforms. However, my main bit of advice is if it, you only have the resources and time to be ever present on one or two, focus on those one or two, but still be active across them. There are things that you can do with posting out with different software, different programs, which can make sure that you are being seen and your, your posts are being essentially cross-posted. So we, we record our podcast every week. Jack over there takes the podcast, usually turns it into around about 10 to 15 individual clips. They go up as TikTok videos, Reels and Instagram, they go into our stories, they go up as videos on Facebook, they go up as YouTube Shorts. Realistically, we've created two different sizes. There is a square size and there is a portrait size. Now Jack puts comments over the top of it, but Jack, correct me if I'm wrong when you're doing that, you make sure that the subtitles are above the point where if you click the video you don't need to reorganize them. So you can take what you're doing existingly and just cross post it across things. LinkedIn goes up on our LinkedIn as well. And our live podcast gets filmed usually on a Wednesday. We filmed, we're filming this week on a Thursday. It gets broadcast on a Friday at two o'clock. It goes live on my personal Facebook, goes live on our company Facebook, goes live on my personal LinkedIn, goes live on Sam's LinkedIn, goes live on YouTube. It then takes the audio and that puts it across all of the podcast platforms, Spotify, 
uh, Apple Music, Google Podcasts, stuff like that, automatically gets distributed out to all of those. It takes us one hour a week to record that podcast, and then Jack edits the videos after that, and we get them scheduled up. We use a great tool, and there are loads out there. The one that we tend to use is Social Pilot, because it allows you to create the queue. So you could say, right, I want to post twice a day, and I want to post at this time in the morning, this time in the afternoon, and you just add posts to it, and say, right, add to the end of the queue, add to the end of the queue, add to the end of the queue. Yes? Of course you can. Different times and different days. Honest, yeah, it's well, it's two things. One, yes, there will be an optimum time to post, but at the same time, the difference if it's engaging content versus not having that kind of doesn't make too much of a difference. I mentioned earlier that we we're in the middle of having a post going viral. I posted that two days ago. Posted it in the evening. It had about a thousand views in the first 24 hours. I went to sleep last night. It had about 8,000 views. And before we started the talk, it had 730,000 views. If it's engaging content, it will get that engagement. Yes, the time can play a bit of a factor. If you're posting at 3 o'clock in the morning, generally don't do that. But if you also think about your business and how your potential customers will interact. So if you're a professional service, for example, we tend to post our podcast clips quite early in the morning because we know people are on their commute on the way into work. So they will watch it. And if it does well in the morning, it kind of has that momentum that takes them into the lunch break and the momentum that takes them in afterwards. If you sell a product and most of your product sales tend to happen at 5, 6 o'clock in the evening, posting at 4, 3 o'clock will be a good way to do it. A lot of the time it's looking at your own data. And it's one of the things that we kind of get frustrated when we hear people go, oh, you can only post on a Tuesday at 8 o'clock in the afternoon. Well, realistically, it depends on your business. These are aggregate averages. But your business will be different to your business, your business, your business, and, and likewise your customers will interact differently to that. So yeah, it, it can have an impact, but if you're consistent with content, for me it's more important that you're getting consistent content out there. One other bit of advice in terms of content is very often people will get a lot of content in one batch. So for example, again today, Sam and I took a photo when we were outside, before we came in, we've taken a photo of the setup, we've got videos going, we will probably take a big selfie later because we're cheesy and we do social media. We will get all of that. By the way, if you don't want to be on camera and you're wanted by the police, then please tell Jack and he'll blow your face. But we will make sure that those clips are featured so it looks like we have wanted people in the crowd and that will help our own engagement. Um, we get a batch of content whenever we do this. We do conferences, we're at the Belfast Business Show tomorrow, so we're doing a keynote talk on lead generation tomorrow. We will get content from that, we will get pictures of the shows, and then we're doing a business networking event, a mini golf event in Belfast, which is that lovely bright pink poster over there where we're playing mini golf with business owners uh, on Wednesday. We will get content and photos from that. I expect at the end of this week with the podcast that we're recording on Thursday to probably end up with about 200 individual bits of content. If I posted them all next week and then we had a quiet week and then posted nothing, it isn't as valuable as spreading that up over time and making sure that you're doing, you know, if you've got enough content for two posts a week all the way up to Christmas but nothing for January, post one a week so that you've got that consistency out. Sam is going to shout on the microphone there. Yeah, there's another thing to focus on here. Oh, sorry, I feel like a ghost. <laughs> Not actually a snake. Um, there's a thing about attention. So a lot of times we as businesses think that attention happens, there you go, that's better. Um, a lot of times people think that attention happens based on time. So they think people are only going to be, you know, I'm only going to be able to catch people's attention at this particular time of the day. Actually, the attention point, generally speaking, is the business that's putting out the information. So if Nike did a, a shoe drop, it doesn't really matter what depth, time of day they do that drop, people are interested. It doesn't really matter what time of day the new next budget gets set by the, you know, by the government, we're going to be focused on what it says, regardless of when they release it. So it's, the attention point is really about what the content is more than when it goes out. To prove a point here, is anybody in the room aware that Peter Kay is doing a comedy tour? Yeah. yeah. It didn't matter, he could have posted those tickets up at 2 o'clock in the morning, that website would have crashed. Well, he did the announcement at 4 a.m. So, it's... We, look, I'm not expecting anybody in here to have businesses that if you post will get Peter K like attention to it. If you did, why are you here? But the point is that if you're putting out that engaging content and it's informative and it provides a bit of value to the people that you have, 
it makes sense. There will be plenty of people in here that offer service-based businesses where people will come to you for a service. I'm quite happy to stand up here and tell you everything you need to do from a paid ads, automation, and organic social side. But I know that a lot of you won't have the time to implement everything that I say. So I know that just from the fact that you're listening to me talk about this and going through different facts, that if you have any questions, you'll come to me, and then further down the line, we might have a conversation about us working together. Like, we don't sugarcoat that as we go through, but we know that the more value we put out, the more likely people are to do it. It's also an issue of trust as well, because we talk about this a lot in business. Having your business being one that they actually trust to deliver the service or deliver the product that you're putting out is very often based on what they've looked in and researched. We signed a client recently, quite a large contract with a client, has multiple businesses. And we know that before they came on board, because they were talking to our sales team, they went through everything, signed the proposal, and only after that did we know in the onboarding meeting when everything had been signed, sealed, delivered, and we were ready to go, that they'd been watching our podcasts. We didn't know that they'd done that. They hadn't mentioned that at all during that process. But we know that they'd gone up because they mentioned things that we talked about in a podcast 10 episodes ago. So the fact that we were putting that out, we know has helped that process a lot because it's subconsciously ticked off a box that we know what we're talking about. So if you are a business and you offer a service, you don't necessarily need to keep every secret and every hint and tip in. Providing that value, if you sell mortgages, giving people advice at this time of the year where everything has gone up in the air, is good to be able to help them because when they do need your service, they will default think about you before Googling it and finding your competitors. So it's just about, a lot of the time it's about playing the long game. And I tend to say to people, you've got your organic strategy is about your branding, it's about your trust, it's about building that, it's about being visible to people so that when they need that service, they'll come to you, they won't go anywhere else. And you can very often combine that with a paid strategy, which Sam will talk about one of the custom audiences a little bit later on. The next thing to talk about is being personable as opposed to being personalised. Now everybody in here will have at some point received an email that says, Hi, your first name, and then details everything. That used to be the absolute forefront of everything being personalised, putting a first name in a subject line of an email. Still has an impact, I'm not saying it's not a good thing, but everybody is doing that now. What we say when we talk about personable is talking about adverts that will go out to people based on what they're likely to be interested in. So I tend to use the example, I'm a big football fan, I tend to fly back over to England and go to football games, I did it on the weekend, that's why I'm a little bit depressed today, but I tend to go to football quite a lot. If you sold burgers, it is a good idea for you to put your pitch up outside a football stadium because people will buy from you. If you have a burger van and you put it outside a stadium on a day that there isn't a match, it's a little bit pointless. So tailoring your offering to what people are likely to do, and what likely they're likely to be, is going to be a really effective way. One of the best examples that I've seen of this in recent years is Virgin Holidays. So Virgin Holidays sent around an email to their entire list that was, our summer sale is on. But that header image in the email was different based on your preferences. So if you loved ski holidays, this was the header image that you saw. If you love beach holidays, this was the header image you saw. And if you loved city breaks, this was the header image that you saw. This is the same email that went out to everybody. But the data that they had on that person based on the holidays they booked and based on the search history that they had when they were signing up to the emails, gave them a different email. And if you love ski holidays and all of a sudden you see a city break, you're not going to be as engaged in the content. But if you love ski holidays and you're thinking about the next one and you see that image at the top, brilliant, yeah, I'm back in the mood of I remember how I used to ski, I want to go on that holiday. When we talk about personable, there are things that you can do through automation chains, and that's my main focus in that third talk today, where you can nurture these potential customers based on their own preferences that are, they are demonstrating to you. We have uh, my old job in-house. We used to sell tickets for a show over in Mallorca. If you've ever been on holiday to Mallorca, there's a big acrobatic show there called Pirates. If anybody in here has been to that, fantastic. Welcome to Small World. I used to run all the digital marketing for that, um, for that company, but they have three very distinct brands. One is family orientated, one is an adult acrobatic show, and one is a rave bingo night that I can only describe as absolutely mental. The target audiences for all three of those nights are fairly different. The two adult shows tended to overlap a little bit, but if you went to the family show, you don't go to the adult shows, because you wouldn't bring your kids to that, and vice versa. 
our marketing for all of them had to be distinctly different. And whilst the, the stage performers and everything like that tended to be the same, they had three distinct Facebook pages, but I could send out an email to the entire database, and based on the categories show that they tended to watch more often than not, that content of that email was completely different to them. So if you have it set up where you're taking enough data to be able to work out what these people are, are interested in, making it personable as opposed to just being personalized is a really good way of doing it. Netflix do this all the time, actually. Um, so if you log onto your Netflix page, they will have a series of five or six different images for one film. And if you're more used to watching films where have, that have a really strong female lead, they will pick the female character out of it. I'm a big Harry Potter nerd. And if you ever looked at the, if you've ever done the um, Harry Potter studio tour in London, it's amazing. And they are a fantastic example of how to get value out of people again and again and again. But one of the first things you do there is, when you're queuing up to go in, they've got all of the posters from when the films were advertised all the way around the world. And I remember in particular the Prisoner of Azkaban, which features Hermione as quite a key character in that film. When that film was shown, or when the posters were put up in Japan, she was the first person on the poster, because there's a big thing about female empowerment. But despite that, in other countries in the world, in Saudi Arabia, the poster very rarely had female actors on it, because it didn't resonate too much with that audience. They're selling the exact same product, but the advertising is personable for the audience that is most likely to see it. It's something that's really worth doing. Sky is actually a fantastic example. We have a few contacts at Sky, and we use Sky advertising from time to time. This, I don't know if people are actually aware of this, but when you watch Sky TV live, the adverts that you watch are 30 second blocks of adverts. You may think if you're watching one channel on Sky's network, that the adverts that you're seeing are the same as the adverts that other people are seeing. You can run an advert on Sky back to somebody who has recently been on your website in a certain geographical area. So if you visited, let's say we had it set up, if you visited our website during the week, I could run a Sky advert in one of those 30 second windows to you on your TV and you would just think that we were absolutely huge. But I'm only showing it to you because you've been on our website. There's a real, like Sam will talk about different target audiences that you can do across the metaverse. But these are personalized, tailored adverts to you that you can see on Sky that nobody else is seeing in your local area because you've done an action that has determined you seeing that. When I heard about that, it frightened me a little bit, I will be honest, but it's a really effective example of companies like Sky and Netflix and everything like that are, are doing this. The new latest one in Netflix, which scared me a little bit, is uh, in-show marketing. So I can't remember what film it is, but it's one of the most recent ones, where in the background of the film, they go past the store. That store is paid to have product placement. I think it's Dunkin' Donuts if you watch the film in America. But if you watch it in the UK, it's a UK brand. It's the background and it's the store where they've green screened it while they've been filming so that they can sell the advertising space based on the user. So it's not just geographical. It doesn't necessarily mean that you might see it differently if you're in the UK versus America. It will work on your preferences. So if you order from Domino's a lot, you will see Domino's as the store that they walk past in the background of the film. So you can start, and this is a hugely growing market, as people are starting to use Netflix, Disney+, Plus, Apple, Apple Video, and Amazon Prime as their videos. You're doing that because you don't want to have adverts, you're paying a subscription. But of course, all of these work on advertiser revenue. So now you're going to start seeing product placement, and it is as subtle as they might be holding a coffee cup, which might say Starbucks, but if you have a Costa account, that coffee cup will say Costa. And if you have an account at uh, Pret, that coffee cup will say Pret. You can make it really hyper-targeted, and it's a little bit worrying. We will touch on the basics of that today, and we will touch on that in a second talk, but honestly, how personable you can make your marketing plays a huge role. The last thing is, or well, the last of the five things that I'm talking about specifically, is Google are removing cookies. So a lot of what I've just said is based on Having cookies, everybody in here has been on a website that says, would you like cookies? And everybody accepts all and, and allows all. The word cookie is the most genius marketing ploy I've ever heard in my life. It is a tracking code, and if it popped up saying, do you want to be tracked on this website for advertising purposes? Most people would click no. But saying, would you like to accept cookies? Is a fantastic way of doing the exact same thing. They just named it cookies. Brilliant marketing ploy. 
But a lot of the technology behind that, if you have an Apple phone, you will have seen pop-ups with the last two updates, last two big updates. They will ask you if you want to be tracked across platforms. 94% of people say no. Google, because of laws that are coming in in California, GDPR is a good starter. The law in California is much, much more stringent. So Google are removing cookies from their platforms. That posed a bit of a problem in terms of marketers. So what we've said is one of the most priority orientated things you need to have in your business is ownership of the data that you have. Now, I'm talking a lot about data collection in our third talk today, so I'm going to go through some hints and tips. But everybody that sells, or most people that we talk to that sell products, again, tend to do it in one way. If they're selling it online, most people will only get the data of that customer at a point at which they're either adding to their cart on some platforms or they've just bought. I say get that data compliantly by requesting it a lot earlier in that process. If you have an offer that might be an offer for a service-based business, it might be an offer for a product-based business, most people will run an advert or put a post that says use this promo code onto the website, direct them to the website and hope that they then purchase. I say we've got 20% off now, fill out your details here and I'll send you the code. Most Customers, you will get less people clicking on that advert than you were going through, but the percentage is, is actually quite in favour. That people will give you information over in exchange for some perceived value they're going to get back. We're running a campaign at the moment for an events company. They tour the UK, they're a big karaoke band, but they tend to sell out venues like the 1,000 plus capacity venues. So they tend to do very well. We're running adverts for them at the moment, which are sign up to the newsletter to get early access to tickets. We are getting people signing up, giving over GDPR compliantly, their first name, last name, email address, phone number, and the city that they live in, and it's costing us 30p a sign up. They've, had, they've spent about £1,000 on their adverts for that, and they've generated about 2,700, 2, ish in the last month into their, into their email sign up list. The benefits of this are massive. Now, Sam's going to talk in the next talk about how you can use that benefit from an ads perspective. We have a direct line of communication with them. You guys will have noticed that I emailed out to you guys beforehand, requesting information, letting you know information, even offering out if you've got any, anybody else that you want to bring with you, by all means, click on the ticket books, uh, click on the link to book some more tickets. I have the ability to run adverts to you lot or send direct marketing to you because you've given me that information in a compliant way. Now you can unsubscribe, and people sometimes get a little bit scared of unsubscribes. And I say, it's fine, if they're going to unsubscribe, they're not likely to be your customers anyway, so you don't necessarily want your messaging going out to those people. But if you can get the data in a lot earlier into this process and use your social media and your organic strategy to leverage that, then it's great. We've just taken over the event marketing for a company based up north that does big rave bingo events. And he has a great strategy where he gets people to, he offers a free ticket if it's your birthday within a week of the show. And he knows most people come in groups of sixes, so he has a good chance that every now and then he'll have a big group. They'll have somebody in the group, and then if I give one person a free ticket, that person becomes the seller of all the other tickets on my behalf. So a bit of a lost leader in that respect is always a good thing. His strategy has been to get people to, to message him on Instagram, and he goes back and manually sends each one of them in that local town a message on Instagram. A lot of manual work, and I will talk about how you can automate almost every part of that through a slightly different method in our third talk today. But there is value because you have that direct line of communication with people. And especially when it comes to direct marketing and emails in particular, for me, they fit into two categories. One, you've got your big mass mailers, which are, we've got a sale on, I'm going to send that email out to absolutely everybody, and I might do that once a month. But on the other hand, you have emails that are triggered based on actions. So again, I'll talk about that in the third talk today, but if we have somebody that's interested in becoming a client of ours, a little insider secret to what we do, we send a proposal out to that person that details what needs to happen. We know if they've opened that proposal, and I can tell how much time they've spent on each page because the system allows me to see that. And because that link is only accessible from the way that I send it out, I know who is looking at the system as well. If I send you a proposal, you wait seven days, don't sign up with us, and then reopen the proposal after day seven, you will get an email on a WhatsApp from us that says, Hi John, just checking to see if you had the time to look over the proposal. I know we sent it over last week. Have you got any thoughts? They're getting that ten minutes after they just opened the proposal. 
That is the point at which we are definitely in their mind. And the responses to that are almost exclusively, yeah, actually, we're just having a look at the proposal, looking through, can we have a meeting and we can organise it? Yeah, fantastic, no problem at all. That's all automatically triggered on the fact that they reopen the proposal. So there's automation that we can talk about, but it only works if you have that person's data in the first place. Aimlessly trying to just put stuff out, hoping that people respond to it, making sure that people have your sort of best intentions at heart. Remember, your customers care about your business less than you do every single time. If there is anybody in here that has a customer that cares more about your business than you do, you have a problem. There's an issue with that. You should care about your business more than all of your customers do. So having an expectation that they're going to take action after action after action and go through multiple different hoops is an unrealistic expectation. You need to make it A, as easy as possible for them, which is why we were talking about how easy it can be earlier. B, as smooth as possible, and as quick as possible, so you're getting as much information as you need, as quickly as you can. Fast website loading speed, really smooth, obvious buttons. You know, we say with an email, there should always be, when you're going through an email, there should always be a call to action in the screen while they're scrolling, scrolling through the email. It can be the same call to action. It can even be the same call to action with different words on it and different buttons. But if you ever sign up to Disney+, Plus, you'll notice that as you're scrolling, there is never a point in the email when you're scrolling through it on a phone where there isn't a button for you to take the action that they want you to take. Make it as easy as humanly possible for people to go through and give you money, and people will eventually start giving you money. That's pretty much the five points, which leaves me around about 10 minutes to the end. And at the end of each of our talks, we're gonna put out for any questions. So has anybody got any sort of specific questions focusing kind of on organics and, and sort of general digital marketing strategy and where you need to be? Raise your hand. Yes? Is it all social media or concentrating with Google as well? <clears throat> Sorry? Is it all social media or concentrating with Google as well? So Sam's going to be talking about Google Ads in particular and Google Ads strategy in a second talk. Not, not Google Ads, Google itself or the advertising. We've uh, done a lot on social media, but I'm just asking, does the talk go into Google? Sort of SEO and being sort of fan, fan searches as opposed to sort of advertising, do you mean? So Sam is going to be talking about that a little bit. The, the, part of the issue in terms of SEO at the moment is people tend to go there when, yes, they're searching for things, but you can have the best SEO of a website in the world. If somebody's running ads for it, you're still going to be number five underneath all four of those ads. So we will talk about, he'll talk about SEO and he'll talk about the sort of optimization in terms of that on Google. My recommendations in terms of that are if you're putting content out like emails, for example, we create emails off the back of the podcasts, we put them up as blog articles on the website. That's naturally going to help you. So there are things that you can be doing at the moment in terms of Google that you could just be putting on your website that will help you be able to appear higher up in those searches. Google My Business is also a good bit, but Sam will touch on Google when he's going through it. He's our Google guy, so whenever we have clients come on for Google, Sam tends to go through it. And he'll talk about the ad side and also talk about organic strategies on Google and, and what would be the best on that as well. Any other questions at all? Yeah. What you're using the information for. Yeah. Yes. But very often people will give you the information over in exchange for the value that you give back. Yeah. So if you yeah, so we'll talk, uh, and Sam will talk about lead generation adverts in Meta in particular. There is a two-step process in Meta where you specifically say what the information is going to be used for, and they have to agree to your privacy policy as they go through, which makes that compliant. Any forms that you have on your website, you usually need to have a tick box that is able to say it. Sam will touch on, he's our IPO officer, so we'll touch on the GDRP, GDPR legalities of it as well. But it's also worth remembering that if I said to you, Right, I know you want to buy this product because I've done my marketing and I know the product benefits you. I will give you 20% off if you give me your email and allow me to email you. You're going to do that because the exchange of value in that situation is more in favor of you. If I said, right, to buy this, you have to give me your information, it doesn't work as well. Peter Kay, I'm using him as an example this week because it's happened this week, but if Peter Kay turned around and said, right, our tickets go on sale, it will be, you could get 48 hours early access to the tickets if you sign up to the P2K newsletter. He would have had a million sign-ups this week. Because people will exchange their information in, in that value that they get back. And Sam will also talk about the difference between marketing stuff that goes out and uh, legitimate interest. So for example, I didn't need your permission today to email you about today's events because you've registered for today's events. 
but I can send you an email about today's event and say, if you enjoy today's event, then you'll enjoy this event, because it's legitimately interesting, because you've demonstrated to me that you're legitimately interested in these events. I will hand over to Sam to go through all of the IPO stuff when he talks and all the GDPR legalities, but you do need to have people's permission. Very often people get scared of the legalities on that and asking for permission. People will give you data if you ask them for it in exchange for some sort of value. Any other questions? I've got about seven minutes before we'll break up the network event, so I'm going to fit like two more questions in. Yes, sir. You're a hire of cutting stuff up, so when you're saying you'll do a podcast and you'll turn it into short videos and square videos, and yeah. is there someone specifically who is like super tailored to be able to do that, or is that something you think someone in house within our organizations or our companies could do? So, generally speaking, it, the better you want to do it, the more work it's going to take, but you can do it to a level without needing to worry about that. So, for example, when we do the podcast, I send them over to Jack. I don't even send it to you anymore. You have access to the system. So once it's recorded for an hour, he'll go in. And you use video editing software to put over the subtitles and stuff like that. We've also got a little bit of an outro at the end of it. The outro and the subtitles are good and they benefit you. But before we brought Jack on board, I used the software, particularly for the podcast, I used a software called uh, Riverside. Now what Riverside does is it records your podcast. So Sam and I usually do the podcast from two different locations. We will uh, basically log into that, but it's recorded remotely through that software. So it records my feed on my computer, records Sam's feed on his computer, and uploads those feeds in the background while we're talking to each other on a live stream. So you've got proper high quality videos. During that, Riverside in particular has a function that as you're going through, you can click a button and it will put a marker at those points. So if I'm making a point where it's like, right, that'll make a good clip, I'll do that. And very often we will talk. I mean, it sometimes sounds a little bit unnatural on the podcast where we will get to an end of the point and then we'll go like this. And then we'll move on to the next point. And it's because I know that I've got a marker at that point and I know I'll put it in. That will save that clip 30 seconds either side of that. And I can go in quite easily afterwards and adjust where it starts and adjust where it finishes and export it from that either in square, in portrait or in landscape function. I can have as many clips as, as I want, or as few clips as I want, and then I just add them into the back of the Q1 social pilot. So when I was doing it myself, we would record the podcast for an hour. I generally speaking would get about 25 clips out of it, because I went above and beyond, and I didn't want to have the subtitles on it. The clips are better quality than the subtitles and logos, so it, it, having somebody do it dedicated does make it better quality. But we were probably out three or four posts a day, just from the podcast, every single week. It took me about an hour and a half after the podcast to do all of the clips and, and send them out. And it was really like a, an idiot's guide to it. Is it CapCut, Jack? That is the, there's an app that's CapCut yeah. where you can basically upload a video into that and, and put it in. But there's, there's a lot that you can do when we talk about things that you're already doing. So we do exhibitions all the time. We have a set list of things that we will get. So as I said, we got the photos this morning. It doesn't take us any extra time we're doing that. Setting up this stand, we have a time lapse of us putting it up and putting it down because it's an interesting thing to see. It does not take me any extra time other than setting a tripod up and putting the phone on the tripod and pressing it. They're very often, when it comes to organics, especially, I'd say, especially the smaller you are as a company, the more people want to follow to kind of see the story behind it. So there will be things where we know people who work from home will do boxing up orders where it will be right, I'm just going to put today, I'm going to package Susan's. Uh, order. She ordered this, and she ordered this, and she ordered this, and people are like, oh, that's quite interesting. But what you're doing in that video subconsciously is telling the user, we sell this, we sell this, we sell this, and this is the best way I've heard it phrased is I'm packing Susan's 50 pound order. I'm going to put it in a this so that that person watching it doesn't feel like they're being sold to, but knows every product that she's bought, and, and the more variety the better, knows roughly what the price point is. So if they're then interested, you've automatically ticked off some of the boxes that they would stumble out on the way. And all that is, is in the person who's packing it, they're doing what they would do normally, they're just maybe voicing it over. So the answer's a little bit, you can do most things in-house, it might take a tiny bit of extra time. I dedicate about an hour every week to writing four or five emails that will be scheduled out and go out twice a week over the course, so we're scheduled past Christmas at the moment for our emails. So there is value in having that. There is value in bringing somebody else to do it, because I've got to be quite honest with you, I really don't want to do the videos anymore, that's why he's here. So he just does that, and I'm happy. So there is value, in, and again, the more professional you make it, the, the better it will be received, but getting some content out that will be 60% of effective 
is better than getting only a few bits of content out that's 80% effective, if that makes sense. It's the consistency that will be beneficial. Yes? And what stage does it become? The SDIY and how you get professional development for the company? Is it the same as it is now? At the point at which the investment makes financial sense to your business. We've turned down clients that we don't think are at the right stage yet. And the reason is, Sam will talk about advertising and make that really effective, but one of the things, especially if you do start running ads, finding the audience, finding the messaging that works from an advertising bit takes a bit of time at the start. So if you're not willing to sort of, or I don't want to say not willing, but not financially able at that point to be able to do that testing to get through to where it optimizes and becomes cheaper, it doesn't make too much sense. In terms of at what point does the organics over to bringing somebody in to do it, with organics, it's sometimes a little bit difficult to judge what your value is. Like, I can't tell you, financially, how much our podcast has brought into the company. But what I can tell you is I can, I can go through deals where it definitely helped get that deal over the line. So whilst I can't accredit it to it, I can credit the touch points. Very often people talk about the seven different points of marketing. So if they're interested in what you buy, it will take seven different touch points. What they very often don't say is that those touch points don't have to be the same thing. They don't have to be seven posts on social media. It might be three posts on social media. It might be a video that's emailed to them. It might be a billboard that they've sent. It might be the sign right in my van. And it might be a recommendation from a friend or family that you're encouraging. There's a lot that, yeah, at a point it does become, this makes more sense to do it. Because I know, Sam and I run the business. And both of us know that there are moments where we become so stressed and so overworked by everything that I have no interest in doing that. I have no interest in ever handling HR myself, because dear God, some of the laws in HR are ridiculous. So a man in Germany sued his company successfully for falling down his own stairs because they told him to work from home. I said that again, that's genuinely true, because they didn't do a risk assessment on his house. That's 100% true. So I have no interest in handling that myself. We have an agency that does that for me. Things like, there, there are certain things where I don't really want to do. We did a DRI for the first, what was the first podcast episode that you did? Was it like 32? 32. 32. We're on episode 45 that we'll record this week. So the 32 previous podcast episodes, I was doing exactly what I said over here. Actually, the first six podcast episodes, we weren't even recording it in that way. We were recording it differently and then just putting the whole two of us on screen up as a, it wasn't as good. And we sort of worked to a point where it's like, right, we're now getting more and more efficient. And it's, again, worth remembering that what you're doing DIY right now will take you X amount of time. If you do it again and again and again, it will start to shrink and start to shrink. So you can start then adding more in. It's worth paying attention in the third talk today where I talk about automation, because I'm not just talking about automation and marketing out, I'm talking about automation and admin inbound. So there's a lot that you can automate that a lot of people don't necessarily know you can. By automating those different steps, saves you time on other things, gives you more time back to be able to do DIY. But it's, for me, the answer is the point at which it financially makes sense. There is value in branding, there is value in posting all the time. What actual value that brings to your business is kind of dependent on things like profit margins, order volumes, regularity. But I would never say that it's not valuable to be seen by more people that are likely to buy from what you do. Because that's ultimately how you set everything. That brings us to half 11. So what we've got now, we've got a bit of a networking opportunity for you guys to all meet each other. Sam and I are going to be hovering around to feel free to come and ask us any other questions, speak to us directly. I know there was somebody who messaged before about video stuff. So Jack, perfect. Jack is over there. Jack, this is the lovely lady I was telling you about. Also, there is a lady, I've got your business card here. You're just over there. Put your hand up. What was your name again? Kerry, that was it. So uh, she is, you work for, do you work for the council? Or do you work for something that's attached to the council? So my understanding is going to be very poor, so I, I apologise for not selling this over the top, but if you're struggling for staff, you have schemes and grants that can be you can talk to. She's got a questionnaire, a little QR code, so feel free to go over and have a chat with her as well. Um, but feel free to intermingle the next talk, if Sam clicks the next button. Next talk is going to be at 12 o'clock on Lead Generation. Just after that, we'll break for lunch, give you an opportunity to go for lunch. And the last talk of the day is on automation and data collection. But thank you for listening to this talk.